Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together once again for this session. We thank you because of what you have revealed to us in the Lord's Prayer. And we pray that as we come to study once again this Lord's Prayer, you reveal yourself to us more than ever before in Jesus' name. Once again, we appeal to you and plead that you teach us how to pray so that our prayers will bring glory to you. Will meet needs that ought to be met in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in us as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. An next consideration of the Lord's Prayer brings us to petitions in prayer. That is part of the prayer that says, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. This part of the prayer deals with the needs of man. When you look at this prayer that the Lord taught his disciples and the Lord is teaching us, you will see that the first part relates to God and his glory. Then you will discover the second part relates to man and his needs. You will also see that, number one, God and his glory is given the first place. Then man and his need, the second place. And isn't that the arrangement that ought to be in our lives? First, God, and then man. First, the kingdom of God and then the needs of man. If you look at this whole prayer very seriously, and you try to analyze, you'll find that there are three elements in the first section relating to God. You will also find that there are three elements in the second part relating to man. You will also find that the first three can be matched with the second three. Look at the first set of requests after introducing the prayer saying, A Father which art in heaven. Then you have three elements following. One, hallowed be thy name. Two, thy kingdom come. Three, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Those three elements deal with God and his glory. Come now to the second part. The second part of the prayer. That is making request unto the Lord for the needs of man. Three again. One, give us this day our daily bread. Two, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Three, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. These three, forming the second part of the requests, deal with man and his needs. Look at that again. When you think about the first three parts, or three elements, our Father, which art in heaven, 
Then what follows is, Hallowed be thy name, referring to God as a father. Second, thy kingdom come, referring to God as king. And three, thy will be done, like a servant will do the will of the master, referring to God as master. So, in the first three elements of the prayer, you have God represented to us as father, as king, and as master. Relate that to the second part of the prayer. As a father, he gives us bread. Family provision. Because a father will feed his children. And so as a father, he gives us the bread and the provision that we need. Now, as a king, the king of the universe and the judge of the universe and the king that demanded obedience from his subjects, but his subjects had disobeyed him as a king. He offers us forgiveness. He offers us pardon. And then as a master, he leads us and we can tell him, Father, you give me bread. King, you forgive my debts. Then, Master, you need to lead me, but lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from all evil. Look at the second part again. The Lord is teaching us here to ask for bread, ask for forgiveness, and ask for leading not into temptation but to deliver us from evil bread deals with the present pardon forgiveness deals with the past we committed sin in the past and as we are praying right now if we're praying for forgiveness we are praying for the sins that were committed in the past as we say lead us not into temptation we're thinking about the future we're saying, you deal with the present in giving me bread. You deal with the past in forgiving my sins. But there is a future. You deal with me and you guide me and lead me because there's a future ahead of me. Well then, as you look at this prayer, you see that the prayer covers every area and aspect of our lives. Provision. Pardon, protection. Looking at the present, we need provision. Give us this day our daily bread. Looking at the past, we need pardon. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And looking at the future, we know that we need protection from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil think about it this prayer bread physical the sin that have to be forgiven both spiritual and mental guilt gives us mental agony and because it gives us mental agony it disorganizes us it destroys us. We cannot even make any decision because mentally our guilt is oppressing us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's asking for the protection of our soul, of our spirit. It is spiritual. Look at Jesus Christ then telling us that in our prayer, we have the physical, we have the mental, we have the spiritual, and God deals with everything as you look at this prayer then you're looking at a prayer that although it is short but everything you can ever request from the lord everything you can ever ask legitimately from the lord everything is in there god and his glory man and his need and the aspect of God that is revealed unto us in the first part matches the aspect of the need of man that is revealed in the second part. 
Now can you see that only Jesus Christ could have compressed all the past and the present and the future into a kind of prayer that is so short and so brief that many, many people read through without even thinking about it. The aspect we're considering today uh, is, uh, as I've told you, petitions in prayer. And as usual, I bring three points to you. Number one, provision through prayer. Provision through prayer. Number two, pardon through prayer. Pardon, the forgiveness of sin through prayer. Number three, prerequisite for answered prayer. Prerequisite for answered prayer. We go to number one, provision through prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. The Lord taught the disciples to pray, and the Lord is teaching us to pray that we can cast our cares on him. We can bring all our requests, all our needs, put everything on the Lord. And we can confidently say unto the Lord, give us this day our daily bread. As we go to verse 25 of this same chapter, the Lord expands it. And he tells us very clearly that we should not take thought about what we're going to eat with what we're going to be clothed or what is it we need in life because he has already taught us that we should tell the lord to give us this day our daily bread verse 25 therefore i say unto you therefore because you are serving god you are worshiping god because you have him as your father your king and your master because you have him as your creator, as well as your redeemer. Because he is the king of Israel and the shepherd of his people. Because he is a responsible, eternal God that has all resources that he can meet your need. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What he shall eat, or what he shall drink, nor yet for your body. What he shall put on is not the life more than the meat and the body more than raiment. And in verse 32, verse 31, therefore, take no thought, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Don't say that. What shall we drink? Don't say that. Wherewith us shall we be clothed? Don't say that. Don't be anxious about the future. In verse 32, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. There is no need in your life that the Lord does not know about. He knows. And because he knows, we have to depend upon him. In Psalm 33. Psalm 33 reading from verse 18 behold the eyes of the lord or the eye of the lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine we don't need to run away from a country where we are evangelizing, doing missionary work because there is famine there or because there is drought or because the economy of that country has gone down. We do not need to write to the headquarters saying, send me ticket, I want to come home because there is famine in the country where I have been sent. Why? Because the Lord his eye is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy 
when you ride home like that and you say this place is dry, there is no food, there is no raiment, there is no sustenance, please send me ticket, let me come back home. The people of this country can go to hell, but I don't want to get hungry. I want you to please relieve me from the famine immediately. It means your hope is not in God. He delivers their soul from death and he keeps them alive in famine. In verse 20, our soul waiteth for the Lord. Don't wait for man, wait upon the Lord. He is our help and he is our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us. According as we hope in thee. Amen. We can trust in the Lord. If we trust in the Lord, the Lord who has taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, he will not fail. In Psalm 34, Verse 9 and verse 10. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. For there is no want, there is no lack, there is no need, there is no scarcity to them that fear him. The young lions do lack, and they suffer hunger. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any, any any good thing if you are saying you know i've been serving the lord i'm a pastor i'm a preacher i'm a missionary but look at the way i'm suffering i lack good things maybe you are not trusting the lord maybe you don't know who your god is maybe your mind your hope is not on the heavenly headquarters Maybe you are not as prayerful as you could. Elijah, it was at the time of the famine. And the Lord sent, the, sent him to the water side, to the brook. And he stayed there. And nobody to give him tithe and offering. And nobody to send any sustenance unto him. But the Lord fed him there. Why do we sing? As God changed, no, my God will never change, and yet we don't believe it. And then the Lord sent him to the widow's house. And when he sent him to the widow's house, you know, that was a prophet having only two members in his congregation. And those two members, one, the widow, and then the son. And when he got there, and the very first conversation they were going to have, he said, can you give me water there? And this was a good woman that even in that situation, expecting that death will come, will go and bring a cup of water. And then while going, our beloved prophet and teacher and the pastor, he said, as we are coming back, eh, I have not taken something today. Give me there a morsel of bread in your hand. And the woman turned back and said, Pastor, preacher, prophet, there is nothing. All we have now is that we will cook this single meal, eat it, and die. But thank God for Elijah. Thank God for people that can trust the Lord. Nothing from Jerusalem. Nothing from Damascus. Nothing from Syria. Nothing from Ahab. Nothing from Obadiah, but here in this place where we are, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. He will deliver them from death. He will feed them in the famine. Elijah said, go and do as I have said. Ariel did just like that. And the Lord began, as they took it, the Lord replaced it. As they took it, the Lord replaced it. Why don't you trust the Lord? Has God changed? He says, I am God, I change not. And Jesus Christ said, when there were 5,000 people with those five loaves and two fishes, how many baskets did you have left? And he said, 12. With the 4,000 and the seven loaves, how many baskets do you have left? They said, said, how is it? I, think I, was thinking, I was talking about bread. When I was warning you, the leaven of the Pharisees, if we have faith in God, we will not die. Verse 10, 
Psalm 34 verse 10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord, they don't seek money, they seek the Lord. They don't seek after the rich people, they seek the Lord. They don't seek favor with men at the expense of righteousness, they seek the Lord. They that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. That's the promise of God. And I believe that that promise will be fulfilled in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. God cares that man's needs be met. Those needs may be physical, material, or spiritual. God cares that those needs are met. He is concerned with the fact that we need food to eat and clothes to wear and a place for shelter, a place to rest. Let me come back to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And let's just look at this verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Let's talk briefly about five things there. Number one, the substance. Number two, the source. Number three, the supplication. Number four, the seekers. Number five, the schedule. The substance, bread. Give us this day our daily bread. As you think about the substance, that the Lord taught his own people to pray for. You will see that this is talking about necessity of life, not luxury. Do you know there are people that are looking for luxury in life and yet they have not got necessity of life? There are people that cannot eat three square meals, people of the world, they're looking for vehicle to ride. There are some people that do not have a good accommodation to live in. They are looking for uh, going in an aeroplane every time they move from one place to the other. But you see, the Lord taught us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. He's talking about necessity. Do you know there are pastors in some denominations that will fight with their denomination? Not on the basis of not having necessity. Not that they don't have food. Not that they don't have moderate clothing. Not that they don't have moderate education for their children. But because their denomination will not give them luxuries. Therefore, they bolt out. They say, I am looking for a place where I can get this and that. I read of uh, something in the newspapers just about uh, two weeks ago, I think. That one of the churches in Lagos here. Uh, he gave, uh, I think, five Mercedes-Benz to five uh, workers in their church. And he publicized that in the papers. We shouldn't do that. And I hope you will not be one of the people that will run to that church and say, ah, if they can give something like that to the people working with their children and to secretaries, what am I doing in a place like this? Well, this is Bible church. You'll never get anything like that. Your reward is in heaven. If you get all your reward here on earth, what are you going to get when we get over there? You might ride a Mercedes here. Over there, you may never get a bicycle. And so Jesus Christ, when he talked about the substance, we are to pray for him. We are to pray for him in our prayer. He talked about necessity. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Reading from verse 7. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with bread convenient for me. Just sufficient bread. That's all we need. Evangelists, pastors, missionaries christian workers that's all we need we don't need extra the lord may come at any time 
You preach that the trumpet will sound anytime. What do you need all those extra things for? Give me bread that is just convenient, necessary for me. Verse 9. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? That's what riches does. It makes you to pray less. It makes you to depend upon God less. It makes you to say, why do I need to fast? Why do I need to depend upon the Lord? All the things are made for me. The bank account is there. The, my, the luxuries are there. The conveniences are there. All the things are there. This man said, oh Lord, I'm praying a prayer. Lest I be fool and deny thee. And I say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal. Then I miss heaven. And take the name of my God in vain. So then in this prayer, number one, the substance. Number two, the source. The source here is God himself. The Lord is telling us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven. And it is to that Father in heaven we are saying, Give us this day our Father our God, the one who brought us here into the world, the one who has redeemed us, give us this day our daily bread. We are praying to God as our source. Our Heavenly Father is the provider, the source of every provision. Now, I need to tell you this. In, at the headquarters church here, we do not plan our programs because of what we have we plan our programs because of what he has whenever we're going to plan a retreat we do not say is there money to plan the retreat and to make us be able to have the retreat successfully we don't ask that question we know that the retreat must be held but there is no money no problem our source is inexhaustible. Is the God of heaven. When we were going to have this congress, and we started preparing, and we needed to help a few of our people from uh, far away African countries, we looked at all that we had, and we looked at all the things that had to be done at this um, IBTC, we looked at uh, what we needed for the section over there, the auditorium we're trying to complete, and for other things, and for food and the various things we will need. And then the church secretary came to me and he said, Sir, look at this. Then on one side he put all that we will need. And then on the other side he put all that we have. You know what we discovered? What we have was about half of what we need. That is, what the headquarters church has in account, in everything, when you rake everything together, what we had was about half of what we need for the Congress alone, not to talk of what we will need after the 8th of January when you have gone home. And then he said, sir, what are we going to do? I said, keep on contacting the people to come. Keep on telling them the date it speaks. Everybody should be here. How about this? I said, don't worry about that. How about this? I said, don't worry about that. How about this? I said, God, God will provide. Don't worry about that. God is our source. When you come here and you see all these things that are here, then you are saying, before I go, I must see the Aegeus. Uh, and they must give me this and give me this, who do I go to? When we have only half of what we need, I don't stop our programs because of that. We don't stop our retreats. We don't stop our congress. I remember 1982. We were to have our retreat, December retreat. And in Lagos at that time, we had 2,000 naira. And we wanted people from all over Nigeria, from Ghana, from other places too. And uh, I saw that we had only 2,000. The 2,000 will not even uh, be able to buy food to feed the people, not to talk of uh, electricity and all the various things. But thank God, 
God is our source. And if God is your source, you will not stop evangelism because there's no money. You will not stop missionary work because there's nothing coming from Lagos. I just depended upon the Lord. And I was taking the time to prepare my messages. And eventually, on the day we are going to have the retreat, uh, some of our people from the north bought cows and brought it down. Other people bought rice. Other people bought other things. Do you know that in that retreat, we had about 70,000 people at the December retreat that time? All in this place. There was no building at that time. Oh, if there's building, will you see? Praise the Lord. If there is no building, praise the Lord. Ah, uh, you see you now. I said, if there is no building, praise the Lord. And there was no building at that time, and we had the retreat. And after the retreat, I don't think we took special offerings every meeting day. Since we began this Congress, did we take any offering? Oh, not because there is money here. Not because we have surplus. We don't have enough. And yet, we won't tell you our need. I'm just telling you, I'm not telling you to come and give anything to me or give anything to headquarters church. I'm just telling you so that you will know that we look up to God and I want you to look up to God. If we will look up to God, the Lord will supply our need. The need of the church, the need of the work, the need of the ministry, the need of the family. In Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Reading from verse 19. Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Is that possible? Can that be fulfilled? Well, the problem is that we read that and what we read is different from what we believe. We read, my God shall supply your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. But really what we have in mind is that my God will supply your need according to his riches in Jerusalem by the general superintendent. That's the way we think. But you see, when you read about it and you believe God, like George Muller believed the Lord and all the needs of the orphanage that he had, everything was fulfilled because it trusted in the Lord. We can trust the Lord. And we're going to keep on trusting the Lord. Number one is the substance. Number two is the source. Number three is the supplication. Give us this day. This is asking the Lord that we have a need and we want him to give us. It means we are asking. We are asking. It's very important that we will pray and we will ask the Lord. Uh, do you know, here is what I discover to be a contradiction, a serious contradiction in the lives of many people who say that they are ministers of the gospel or they are children of God. The contradiction is this. They are so ignorant of the Bible. They count it as spirituality that they never pray for any physical need. And they will tell you, I never pray that God will give us money to do the work in the church. They will tell you, I never pray, I never ask God, that God will give us all that we need to handle the work. Now, when they say that, they are acting spiritual. But these people who don't ask God, they ask man. They don't ask God, but they ask man. They say, you see me now, I ate only once yesterday, and I'm your pastor. That clothes you see on my child, that's the only clothes he has. And your children are changing clothes. I see you bringing your children to church. That one I have on my child, that is the only one he has. And I'm your pastor. Well, God will reward you people. The way you are treating me and dealing with me. Why don't you go and ask God? They don't ask God, they ask man. They will pester man, they will trouble man. 
And if, if I give them chance, they will pester me almost to the point I will not have a chance to even prepare my Bible study outline. They want this, they want this, they want this. Why don't you understand that the man standing here is not your source? Why don't you understand that the God of heaven, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of all impossibilities, the God that Abraham said unto the king of Sodom, he said, when Abraham when Sodom, the king of Sodom said, Give me the people and you take all the goods. Abraham said, Me, I've lifted up my hand to the Lord that I will not take anything belonging to you, not even a shoe lashes, so that you, the king of Sodom, will not say, I made Abraham rich. The God of heaven, he'll make Abraham rich. Are you of the seed of Abraham? Then walk in the face of Abraham and understand that if we can trust in the Lord, our God will never disappoint. Ask him, pray to him, tell him what the need is. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. And in verse 2, Ye lost and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Number four, the seekers. Who are the people seeking? It says, give us, us who? Us, the children of the Father. Us, the subjects of the kingdom. Us, the servants of the master. You know, when it says give us, these people that are saying us are the one that had already said our father, which are in heaven. These are children of God. These are the ones that have desire and concern for the kingdom of God. These are the subjects of the kingdom. These people that are saying us, they are the people that have said, Thy will be done. They are the people that have accepted the Lordship of Christ and the Lordship and the authority of God upon their lives. If you are a child, if you are a subject of the kingdom, if you are a servant of the master, then you can come and you can say, Lord, I'm cleansed with the blood of the Lamb. I'm a child of God. I'm subject to your kingdom. I'm totally submissive to your will and to your plan on the basis of that. Since I don't take any step except what you tell me to take. I don't lift up any hand except when you tell me. I don't go anywhere except where you tell me to go. I'm completely subject and submissive to the rules and to the order, the authority of the king of the kingdom. On the basis of that, Lord, give us this day are deliberate. You see, it is when we're totally depending upon the Lord. Now, we are to trust the Lord. If we're children of the Father, if we're subjects of the kingdom, and if we're servants of the heavenly master, we are to trust the Lord. You know what happens when we don't trust the Lord? When we put our trust in man, do you know what happens? Jeremiah Chapter 17, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. Do you know there is a curse from the Lord upon the people that shift their focus, their faith, their trust, their confidence away from the Lord and they depend upon men. It may be that they depend upon the rich man 
And it may be that as they depend upon that rich man, rich man, whatever he does in that congregation, he can go scot free. He can commit immorality. He can tell lies. He can be fraudulent because they trust him. They depend upon him. They have faith in him. They are expecting provision from him. They cannot touch him. He is untouchable. It's unfortunate that some churches are becoming churches where there is no discipline. You can't discipline the pastor himself. He'll brainwash all the members in that church and make them run away with him. You cannot uh, discipline anyone in the choir if they do wrong because they will blackmail you all over in the whole city and in the whole church. You cannot discipline the choir. You cannot discipline the members of the church. The workers in the church, you cannot discipline them. And what makes people not to be able to do that is that they trust in those men. And they feel that if so-and-so is not there, how is the church going to remain? If so-and-so is not in this church, how will this church ever continue? The trust in man. Do you know when you come to such a position in your life as a leader, as a, as a pastor, you come under the curse of God. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Verse 6, For he shall be like the earth in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh. A person that is trusting in men, trusting in rich people, trusting in rich, prosperous women in the church, and is just looking, he'll be visiting those rich people, he'll be uh, sending greeting cards to those uh, rich people, we don't, uh, we don't use greeting cards in our church here. We used some years ago when I just allowed people to do what they suggested we should do. But now that I made up my mind, I'm coming back to the Bible. We cancel all those worldly, pagan, heathen things. We don't do it. And our preacher preached in the morning. Uh, I think he mistakenly said, you don't celebrate uh, Christmas with your family. We never celebrate Christmas in this church. What else, have you ever heard us singing Christmas carols in Deeper Life? No. Have you ever heard us saying we're going to have Christmas retreat? No. We call it December retreat. You know why? Christmas has a pagan heathen origin. You see, there are lots of things. That, watch the headquarters. Watch what we do. And watch what we don't do. And when you watch, you will understand that we have read the Bible, we have studied the Bible, we have reason for what we do, we have reasons for what we don't do. So I don't want any of you to go back home to your various countries and then say that I had in the Congress at the headquarters that uh, they should celebrate Christmas. Well, you should be intelligent enough to know that there are times preachers themselves need correction. You are preachers yourself, and I'm sure you know I can correct you if I came to your location. And so when you are here, you need to understand that you trust in the Lord. Christmas cards, Christmas celebration, all those pagan, hidden things, we don't get involved. You trust in the Lord and in the Lord alone. If you trust in the Lord, then it will supply all your needs. Now the schedule. I've talked about the substance. I've talked about the source, and then the supplication, and then the seekers. Now number five, the schedule. The schedule is just for this day. Just for this day. Don't worry about yesterday. Yesterday is gone. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. And if it comes, the God of today will be with you tomorrow. And because of that, all you are concerned about is that you are given the bread for this day. Do you know there are people that will, you know, look at themselves and then they look at their accounts. They have eaten today. They are well clothed today. They are accommodated today. Everything they need today is there, but they look at their accounts. And they call their wives to sit down. They say, my wife, look at this. If we stay 
in this place, what future do we have? Look at it. Although we eat today, although we are close today, although there is accommodation today, if we stay like this, where is the future? Are you an unbeliever? The future is in the hand of God. The God of yesteryears, the God of yesterday, the God who saw us through from the time we came into the kingdom until this day. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Is he not able to take care of tomorrow? All that the Lord said we should pray for is the bread for today. That's the schedule. Don't be unbelieving. Have faith in God. Will God die by tomorrow? Will resources dry up in heaven by tomorrow? Why then don't you understand what the Lord is telling us to emphasize? Is that sufficient? For the day, for today, is the evil thereof, the activities thereof, the trouble, the trauma, the trials thereof, that what you have for today is enough. When tomorrow comes, the Lord will take care of tomorrow. Look at this again. Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord wants us to trust him. And the Lord wants us to understand he is the one that brought everything out of nothing. And because he brought everything out of nothing, he is able to still do that today. Look at chapter 11 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So that things which are seen, all these visible things, concrete things, tangible things that you can see and hold and feel, they didn't come out of visible things but out of the invisible, out of things that were not even there. He made everything out of nothing. Let's now go to point Number two, pardon through prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here we come to forgiveness. Pardon for sin. The most essential, the most blessed, and the most difficult act that God ever did for man was to provide forgiveness of sin. Essential, blessed, difficult. It is the most essential because it keeps us from eternal suffering in hell. And it gives us joy in our present life. That's why it is the most essential thing that God does for man. It is the most blessed because it introduces us into fellowship with God and it secures a place in heaven for us. It is the most difficult because it costs the Son of God is very life on the cross to provide that forgiveness for us. Forgiveness of sins, therefore, is man's deepest spiritual need. And the Lord has promised that if you are a sinner and you confess the sin unto the Lord, you forsake them, depending on the death sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary, that he will forgive. And people from the Old Testament to the New Testament have always known that. And they have always prayed that God will forgive them their sins. In Psalm 25 verse 11. For thy name's sake, O Lord, Pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. 
Even when the iniquity is great, God forgives on condition you ask him. On condition you recognize that iniquity as iniquity. On condition there is no excuse for it. On condition you are not painting it by a better name. You call it what it is. You know how deadly. You know how destructive it will be. And you go to the Lord with a burden and with godly fear in you. Knowing that except that sin is taken away, you'll be forever lost and you'll burn in the lake of fire. With that agony and anguish and sorrow of heart, repenting and turning away from that sin, hating it, even hating yourself for doing it before, you go to the Lord in prayer and you tell him, Oh Lord, pardon my iniquity. You don't shift blame on your wife. It's my wife that made me do it. Eh? When my wife was not available, when I would say, let us do this, and she would say, eh, I am weak now. I want to sleep now. I am tired now. I, I can't do anything now. And that's why she was the one that pushed me out to go and commit immorality. If you talk like that, you'll never be forgiven. You'll spend eternity in hell. If you steal, you go to God in prayer. With the guilt upon you, you don't say, hey, they didn't pay me for three months in a place of work and our church members did not give me money, what was I to do? Am I going to just suffer and starve myself and die? It's better to be hungry and die in hunger and go to heaven than to go and steal and go to hell. You don't put blame on anyone when you have sinned. And you don't excuse your sin. You don't say, eh, they are talking that eh, I did this bad thing, I did this bad thing. That's the problem with our church. All the good things I've been doing for all these uh, 20 years and 30 years, they will not talk about that. The little adultery I committed now, eh, this is the only sin I've committed since I came to this church for the past 20 years. That's the one they are talking about now. If you talk like that, you'll never receive forgiveness. When you recognize sin as sin, evil as evil, transgression as transgression, and you realize it was that single sin that took Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden and they lost paradise and they were driven out and God put an angel there with the sword that they will never be able to come back there again. When you realize that is sin, then you'll be forgiven. You remember Moses? Look at his sacrifice. Look at his dedication. Look at his self-denial. Look at his absolute surrender. Look at his suffering. Look at everything that he went through. Look at his ministry. Look at all that he sacrificed. Look at the way he prayed for them when they made the golden cow. Then, one thing. Go and speak to the rock. He was still in that ministry. It was because of those children of Israel. And he took the rod in his hand. And he came before that rod. And he said, Ye rebels, shall we bring water? We. They are bringing it now. They are the one doing it now. It's by their power now. Shall we bring water out of the rock for you? Then he struck the rock. He didn't steal didn't commit adultery, he didn't lie, he didn't blaspheme, he didn't beat anybody, he didn't slap anybody. There are not pastors here that beat their wives, and they're still pastors. He didn't beat anybody, he struck the rock. Water came out, miracle. You want miracle? <laughs> you can stay in that miracle and go to hell. Miracle. The water came out. You know how many people drank? The miracles you have performed, how many people benefited? 10 people, 20 people, 100 people. We're talking about 3 million people that drank miracle water. After they finished drinking, God said, Moses, we need to talk together. Yes, Lord. You didn't sanctify me before the people. You didn't honor me. A father which art in heaven. 
hallowed be thy name. Hallow the name of God. Be careful. You didn't sanctify me. Hallow my name. Honor me before the people. Moses, the promise I gave you before, that you will lead these children of Israel to the land of Canaan, I withdraw that promise. I cancel it. You will not get there. Moses and Moses could pray. You talk about prayer. Are we praying here? And Moses began to pray. We're talking about a man that prayed and removed the judgment of God away from a whole nation. It came to his turn and he prayed. And let me tell you, friends, others didn't pray for him. You know, church, the work of the ministry is difficult. The pastor prays for people. And he leads people up. But let something happen to him and see who will pray. They <laughs> say, did you hear? Eh, I am strong. I am strong. It has come to his turn. Only gossip. Nobody prayed. When God said, Moses, leave me alone. Let my anger wax hot against them. I will disinherit them and make of you, Moses, a great nation. Moses went to the Lord. He cried. He said, oh, Lord, I don't want to be a great nation. Make these people your people. Let us know that you are still with us. He prayed. He said, God, if you do that, the Egyptians, they will say, because you do not have the power to lead them into the land. That is why you destroy them. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed, and God said, Moses, I changed my mind. Tell them, I will go with them. But warn them, warn them, they are stiff necked Moses, if it were not you, I would have destroyed them. But tell them, I pardon them. But when it came to Moses, who prayed for him? And God called Moses and he said, Moses, you will not get there. And Moses prayed. God said, keep quiet. And Moses prayed again. God said, keep quiet. And Moses prayed again. He fasted. And God said, don't speak about that matter again. All I can do for you, come up to the mountain here. And he climbed up the mountain. He said, you see the land so near, so far. And he died there. Sin, you play with sin, you think that preaching will cover sin, walking miracle will cover sin, doing crusade will cover sin, you think that all you are doing, jumping up and jumping down, who cannot jump? Judas can jump, demons can jump more than you are jumping. We're talking about getting serious with God and knowing that if there is a single sin in your life, you cover all because Jesus does not know. Other people that know will not talk about it. You'll be lost forever. We'll be there together. We'll see. We'll examine. Oh, by the grace of God, I'll be up there. And you guess what I will do? For the first, who knows? <laughs> Wonderful God. Who knows? For the first hundred, one thousand years, I'll be going from mansion to mansion. I said, who, who is there? I'll say, where are these deeper life people? I'll say, where is so-and-so? I'll ask the Lord, I'm telling you. I'll ask the Lord. I'll say, where is that miracle worker? Where is that missionary? Where is that state overseer? And you think everybody will be there? I don't know. I don't know. Depending on your attitude to sin. If you don't deal with the sin here, if you are covering it up, if you are thinking, once they don't know, once they don't discipline me, uh, you will escape the discipline here. There is an eternal discipline. It's forever and ever. And it will be burning and burning in the lake of fire. That is why it is necessary that you will take the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. You will take it seriously. And if there is sin in your life, you will go to God. I'm not talking about raising up hand. I'm not talking about this five-minute prayer we pray. I'm not talking about if God is good, God is loving, God is a, a very good person, is charming, is a, this and that. A, you know, he loves everybody. He doesn't want anybody to perish. Oh, yes, he doesn't want them to perish, but they perish. 
And therefore, if you want forgiveness now, raise up your hand. And with no tear, with no agony, with no sorrow, with no remorse, with no regret, you just smile and raise up your hand. God, I'm here to you. I want forgiveness. Uh, Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. And I'm one of the people, you know me, I am weak. I am not strong at all. It is only this immorality that is private, uh, troubling me. Oh God, I'm here. Forgive me. You will not be forgiven. You pray for forgiveness, laughing. You pray for forgiveness, jesting. You pray for forgiveness without sorrow for sin. Without repentance. Without turning away from it. Without agonizing. Don't you know? Don't you know? That when Jesus was going to pray. The price of our redemption. Don't you see the agony? Have you never heard of Gethsemane? Have you never heard of the sweat of blood? Have you never heard when he went to the cross and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you never heard when he cried agonizing on the cross because of your sin? If he agonized like that, and then you come saying, Oh God, I want forgiveness, many people are lost like that. And we deceive many people in our churches. Look at deeper life churches, church of today. Sometimes I, I move around and I go to preach in a deeper life church and I give a simple salvation message and I say if you know there is sin in your life and you need to have forgiveness of your sin, raise up your hand and tell you I've been in some churches deeper life where 90% will raise up their hands in the choir among the ushers among everywhere they don't know the seriousness of repenting and turning away from sin and calling upon the name of the Lord so they can be children of God. All they know is I am deep alive. I am deep alive. There is no jewelry but there is anger. There is no lipstick but there is bitterness. There is calf on the head but there is envy, jealousy in the heart. Deep alive. But when you take sin as serious and you say Lord this is what sent the Lord to the cross of Calvary. And I need to deal with it. And there is no sin in the life of the preacher. There is no sin in the life of the members of the church. And then they can go out and witness to other people and tell them, repent ye and believe the gospel. Except you have repented yourself, what right do you have to tell any other person to repent? Wouldn't you then be a hypocritical preacher, telling others to do as I say, but not as I do? Therefore, if we're going to have forgiveness of sin, we must take sin serious and know that if that is the only prayer you pray in your life and you pray that through and you have the forgiveness and you have the cleansing, you have the holiness of life because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And then when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise, then we which are alive, alive in Christ, alive in righteousness, alive in holiness, we which are alive shall be caught up together with them and so shall we ever be with the Lord because it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when it shall appear we shall see him and we shall be like him he that has this hope in him he purifies himself even as God is pure because except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God therefore I say unto you be ye there Therefore, perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You want to live a righteous life. You want to deal with sin in your life. You want to know that by the grace of God, by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, there is no sin. There is no evil. Not in your thoughts, not in your desires, not in your disposition, not in your tendencies, not in your nature, not in your character, not in your habit, not in anything that you do. There is no diplomacy. There is no duplicity. There is no hanky-panky. There is no backhanded kind of black uh, diplomacy. But you are straightforward. You love the Lord. You love the word of the Lord. You have dealt with sin once and for all. And you have told the Lord, Oh Lord, if that is the only blessing I have in my life, to be free from sin. To be free from sin. That I can just look up to the Lord and I can say I praise the Lord because the blood of his son Jesus Christ 
cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If that is all I can say, that I'm, by the grace of God, in the fear of the Lord, perfecting holiness, so that I know that if it shall appear at any time, sin is dealt with, sin is removed, sin is totally taken away, and the life is a beautiful life. The light is shining. The light is shining so that men around you will be able to see that and they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, when we pray this prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Why don't we look at four things there? Number one, the problem. Number two, the promise. Number three, the plea. Number four, the power. Number one, the problem. This is the problem of sin. The problem of sin. Sin makes men guilty. And sin brings men under judgment. What is sin? Different words are used in the Bible, especially in the Greek, concerning the word sin. And from the various Greek words, listening to this, you have these five descriptions and definitions of sin. Number one, sin is missing the mark of God's required standard. Sin is missing the mark of God's required standard. Look at the standard of God. Very high, very holy, unstained, very pure. Look at that standard. When you miss that standard, it is sin. Number two, sin is stepping across the line. That's what the English edition calls transgression. You transgress. You step across the boundary line. The Lord has drawn a boundary. And he has drawn the line. And when you step across that line, you go beyond that line in thought, in word, in deed, in action, in all that you do. You step across the line. That what you do is not totally of God. You have stepped over the line. It is not totally according to scripture. You have stepped over the line. It is not totally according to what Christ would have done. You have stepped over the line. Transgression. You have sinned. Number three, sin is lawlessness. It is the flagrant breaking of God's law. It is like sin. I know what God wants. I know what he requires. I know what he wants me to do, but I will not do it. You become lawless. You act as if there were no Bible. As if there were no commandment. As if there were no warning. You, became, you become a lord of yourself, a master of your faith, and a captain of your soul. You reject his lordship. You reject his authority. You reject his control. You reject the restraint. You reject the restriction that God gives you. And you say, I will do what I want. I will say what I like. I will go where I want. When you act like that, you become simple because you are lawless. Sin is lawlessness. And it is the flagrant breaking of God's law. Rebelling against God. Number four. Sin is sleeping, sliding, falling. One of the Greek words used for sin just simply means you sleep. It's, it appears that the ground under you is slippery, and therefore you sleep. You are not walking orderly, carefully, fearfully, prayerfully. And in that careless moment, you make a sleep, and then you fall. You slide. There's, it's the loss of self-control that you couldn't control your thoughts, your mind, your body, your flesh, your appetite. Because of the loss of self-control, then you sleep. You fail. Number five, sin is debt. D-E-B-T. Our debts, as we forgive our debtors. It's an unpaid debt. That we owe God. And you've owed God since you were born. 
and you kept on owing and owing and owing, and you cannot pay. Now, if you look at all these definitions of sin, let me tell you, the greatest message you need for yourself, for your own good, for your own eternal happiness, is to understand the definition and description of sin in the Bible. Do you remember that God is no respecter of persons? He will not be partial. If you don't understand what sin is, you'll be sinning every day. You'll be lawless. You'll be stepping across the line. You'll be missing the mark. You'll be owing God unpaid debt. And you will not worry about it. Then it will be on a final day when you get to a point of no return. Because the Bible says, where the tree falleth, there it will lie. It's for eternity. Once you die like that, with an unconfessed sin, a sin you did not deal with, a sin that you are harboring, appreciating, a sin that you are petting, a sin that you are saying, well, that is just my weakness. Once you die like that, maybe in an accident, maybe just you sleep in the night and you don't wake up anymore, and how many people miss, oh, brother so-and-so, brother so-and-so, and then they will say, he has gone to heaven, he has gone to, we don't know, we don't know, do you know? How do you know where they have gone? And then we bring the choir together and the choir will sing about heaven, about the faithfulness of the righteous. <laughs> they think the rascal there in the casket is, is faithful. That's what they think. And then after all the singing, the man is crying in hell. The people are singing that he's in heaven. When we get to heaven, you'll discover some of the things I tell you. You know, when I preach, some of the things I say, some of you don't believe. Some of you think that is hard. Some of you think that cannot be. When we get there and you get to the other side, oh, you say, that crying preacher, he said so. But we didn't know. We thought he was just, you know, why, Jesus, why doesn't he preach in a dignified manner? Can you see people going to hell and be dignified? Can you know what I know and be dignified? Can you see what I see and be dignified? Don't you know I see something beyond, you know, what you think, what you are sitting down? I see much more than that. I hear something. I hear it from upstairs. And when, if, I, if you hear what I hear, not from people, not from, I'm telling you, it's another thing. Let's leave that side. If you know that, if you hear that, if you see that, <laughs> you'll cry more than I cry. You know, when we get over there, and you see, you see the great beyond, and you see that signboard written in letters of fire, that this is hell, a point of no return. And you read it, and all your senses come awake, and you remember all that you ever did, all that you ever said, everything you were hiding, everything comes before you like a big picture. And you see yourself with that prostitute. You see yourself with that alcohol. You see yourself with that stealing. You see everything in a big screen. And everybody can see. And then, as you are looking like this, your legs become weakened. And you are sinking and sinking and sinking. And the fires are getting nearer and getting nearer. And you are crying, oh God, oh God, oh Jesus, where are you? The day of redemption is gone. And then you drop in there. You might even call my name. And say, Father Abraham, or Father so and so. No help. No help. No relief. I might be able to talk to you. Who knows? I might say, January 94, you had a chance to make it right. But you refused. You jested. You discussed it. I know. You discussed it at the hostel. Is that how he preaches? Is that how he's emotional? Is that what they have been talking about? I thought that... <laughs> you will remember. 
Oh. If all of us here this morning, if you could realize the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, and you take it serious when he says, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, if that is all this Congress can do for you. There are people that preach all their lives, and they don't have more than six, seven souls. Look at Noah, 120 years. Himself and the others only eight. What am I looking for? If all of you here, you are more than eight, if you are cleansed and washed, and you become innocent, and you become pure, and you hate sin, and you hate evil, and God looks at you like this, and you are no white, no sin, no error, no evil. If that's all God does for me, what else am I looking for? Do I want to go to America to go and preach? If all of you here are saved and spotless and pure, God has blessed me. That's enough. You will do the rest. What you have got, you will give to other people. But if I preach all this, you see how I tell you, and I say everything the way I say it, and you jest, and you are not serious, and I'm preaching my heart out, reading the Bible to you, you know it's the Bible, and there's no change, no transformation, well, <laughs> I'll keep on preaching though, because he said, whether they will hear or forbear, Although they be briars and thorns and the rebellious house, Ezekiel, keep on teaching them and telling them. Then you would have saved yourself. Because when I say unto a righteous man that thou shalt live, if that righteous man, if he goes to sin, all his righteousness I will no more remember. But because you did not want him, his blood will I require at your hand. But if you want him, if you speak to him, and he does not repent, he does not change, he continues his way. You have saved yourself. Well, by my saying it, by my preaching it, by my revealing it to you, I've saved myself. Now I can go and I can say, Lord, I told them, I wrote it in book, I put it in cassette, I put it in video. None of you can say you are ignorant. You know it. You know that sin will damn your soul. If you continue in sin, I've told you. I've read it to you. I've explained it to you. And so none of us can give any excuse anymore. I pray that our lives will change. I pray that during this Congress, everyone will take the Lord serious. And will take salvation, will take forgiveness, will take purity, will take holiness very seriously. And will say, Lord, if I don't have any other thing, I want to be righteous. I want to be righteous. And I want to really serve the Lord without any sin in my life. That's the problem. Is there a promise? Oh yes, there is a promise. The promise of forgiveness in Micah. Chapter 7, Micah chapter 7, reading there from verse 18. Here is a promise of the Lord telling us what he will do to our sin when we turn away from the sin and we abandon that sin completely. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? and passeth by a transgression, the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever, because, because he delighted in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's the promise of forgiveness. Now, when you look at forgiveness in the Bible, what are the shades of meaning that forgiveness connotes? Number one, it means the taking away of our sin. God looks at all those things as real, tangible things, and then he takes them away. 
Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the whole world. Number two, it is the covering of our sin from his side. In Psalm 85, Psalm 85, and in verse 2, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. When God covers up all those things away from his side, that is forgiveness. Number three, it is the blotting out of our sin. The blotting out, erasing them from the record he has written down. That is Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25. Number four, it is forgetting all our sins. That's Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. Their sins I will remember no more. Now, when we talk about forgiveness, there's something that the people who have been reading the Lord's Prayer have not understood for a long time. They said, but we children of God were forgiven already. We children of God we are already, we already have the forgiveness of our sin. Why then are we saying that this is a prayer that believers can pray? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The reason you say that perhaps is because you do not understand that there are two kinds of forgiveness. One, one is the initial forgiveness at the point of salvation given by the great judge of heaven. You came before the judge. You were condemned because of your guilt. And because of that condemnation, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And right there, your substitute, your advocate, your savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to your rescue. And he said, Father, God, judge of the whole earth, I bear the punishment for him. I will suffer for him. Because of that, the justice of God is met already. And therefore, you go free. That forgiveness is the initial forgiveness. That forgiveness is the one given by the judge because of your sin bearer. But it's a second kind of forgiveness. We call this parental forgiveness. Parental forgiveness as in the family between a father and the children. You have children who are born again. And those children, although they are born again, there are times they do things that are wrong. Not, listen to me, sins that will take them to hell on the face value. What I mean is, it is not the sin of First Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. It is not fornication. It is not idol worship. It is not adultery. It is not being effeminate. It is not homosexuality. It is not stealing. It is not covetousness. What they have done in the family might just be leave what you are doing now and go and eat your food. And that boy or girl did not quickly, instantly, obediently eat that food. Dragged his feet and eventually was there. And you say, ah, 30 minutes ago I told you, you have not finished that food. If that child is a good child, the child will say, I am sorry. The child has offended, but the child has not committed sin to take him to hell. You understand? And the father will say, all right, don't do that again. I want instant obedience when I tell you to do something. I forgive you. That is parental forgiveness. Initial forgiveness. God forgave the adultery, the fornication, the evil. He forgave the sins you committed that could have taken you to hell. Now you are a member of the family. And there are times that the things you should have done, you didn't do. 
Let me give you an illustration. We had workers retreat last year here. And when one of our brethren, some of our brethren came from the east, a pastor from Abba gave us a message, I think, on evangelism. And he gave us an illustration of something that actually happened. The Lord had spoken to a particular member of his church at Abba to go and witness to an individual. And this uh, member of the church did not immediately go and do the witnessing. And eventually, I think, second or third day or whenever he felt he was now chanced, he went there and knocked on the door. And he said, I'm asking for Mr. So-and-so. Oh, they said, that's why we're all sorrowful. He died, I think, this morning. And when our pastor at Abba gave us that story, it woke all of us up. That many of us, although we have been forgiven of our initial sin, of the initial forgiveness when we came to the Lord, that we as children of God, there are things in the family the Lord had been telling us, do this and do this, although we do it eventually, but we're so slow that the Lord still has to forgive us, parental forgiveness. And so then you realize, as a child of God, don't you know the Bible says, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. It's not, that's not a, it may not necessarily be adultery and other things. It may be things that you will not even think about. And when you hear the word of God, the spirit of God will come to talk to your heart as a child of God. That look at you. You are not making our heavenly father happy. You are slow. You are sluggish. You are dragging your feet. And then you are convinced that you have not walked perfectly before the Lord as a child you come then for parental forgiveness. Think about it this way. Christians, born again people, children of God, even though they are still Christians, when they miss the mark or they leave some good things undone, they need to go to God for parental forgiveness. On the other hand, backsliders who have completely gone, completely backslidden, and they have gone into adultery, fornication, of the which things I tell you, and as I told you before, that none that do these things shall inherit the kingdom of God. When you want forgiveness, you have gone back to square one. You are talking about forgiveness because you are a sinner. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, because I'm a sinner. Backslider. The third kind is for the outright sinner that never knew the Lord at all, and he wants to enter into the kingdom of God. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thought, and let him return unto the Lord, for he will pardon him. He will forgive him and, and abundantly pardon. Then the plea for forgiveness. You are pleading, forgive us our debts, as we forgive those that are debtors to us. Asking pardon is necessary before the sinner can be forgiven. Sinners are commanded to repent, confess, and forsake all the sins. No sinner ever received salvation without repentance and faith in Christ. Number four is the power for righteous living. You've dealt with the problem. You've held on to the promise and you are pleading before the Lord to forgive, then he forgives you and he gives you the power to live a righteous life. That is the evidence you have received forgiveness from the Lord. Very quickly, point number three, prerequisite for answered prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, and in verse 12, Forgive us our debts. How? Exactly as, in the same way as we forgive our debtors. In verse 14 and 15, Jesus gave explanation. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, 
your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Why do we have to forgive? Number one, because it is characteristic of the saints of God who have experienced the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. The Lord has shown you love and mercy and grace in gratitude. You then forgive the people that offend you. The grateful heart will joyfully forgive and forget the offense of others. Not only that, we forgive because it follows the example of Christ. The severity of any offense against you cannot match what was forgiven by Christ himself. Not only that, if you forgive others, that grants you mercy and it delivers you from divine chastisement. If you don't forgive, you won't get forgiven. We are to be merciful and we are to forgive promptly and fully, wholeheartedly and permanently if we also want to be fully and completely forgiven by God. He who cannot forgive others breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. Look at that bridge over that river. And the river is so wide and so deep and so dangerous too, that you cannot cross without that bridge. When you refuse to forgive others who offend you, you are breaking the bridge over which you yourself must eventually pass. Let me remind you of the story that Jesus told. When he likened the kingdom of heaven to a particular king, that had a servant. And this servant owed him 10,000 talents. And then he checked up his records and he called the man, pay what you owe. And the man fell down, pleaded and begged. He had nothing to pay. The king would have sold him to slavery and sold his wife and sold his children to be able to collect a little part of what the man owed. But the man pleaded and begged. And eventually, the master said, you are forgiven. So he was forgiven. And then he went out. And he saw another servant. This other servant owed him 100 pence. And he held on to him. By the throat, pay what you owe. And this fellow servant pleaded and begged. But he will not listen. And he went and threw him into jail. When all the other servants saw that, they reported to the king. And the king said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt, and you wouldn't forgive your fellow servant. Then he cancelled his forgiveness and threw him into jail. Understand this. There's an important point in the story. The parable. The man owed 10,000 talents. In the calculation of the currency of those days, one talent is 6,000 denarii. It is one denarius that is one day's wage. To be able to earn, for that servant, to be able to earn 6,000 denarii, denarii is the plural of denarius, so, to be able to earn the 6,000 denarii that will make one talent will take him, if he works six days a week, it will take him 1,000 weeks approximately. Approximately, that is 19 years to earn one talent. To earn 10,000 talents 
multiply 19 years by 10,000, it will take him 190,000 years walking every day without getting sick. Impossible. His debt was impossible to pay. That's the story. That's the point Jesus was making. Your debt was impossible to pay. It will take so long. You don't have such a long life. You will not be all that healthy for 190,000 years to be able to walk every day and pay your debt. And the Lord forgave everything. It shows the magnitude of the forgiveness of God. Listen. The servant is so owed him 100 denarii. The 100 denarii will be the wages of less than four months. The debt he owed, he had to work 190,000 years to earn it to pay. What the other fellow owed was only for about four months' salary. One third of a year, he couldn't forgive him. 190,000 years debt, four months, one third of a year debt. He held him by the throat. You must pay me. He threw him into jail. Isn't that what we have done? All the sins God has forgiven you of great magnitude, indescribable, that you could never pay, and it took Jesus to come from heaven to die on the cross of Calvary for the pure blood of the innocent Son of God to be shed for you before you can be forgiven. And then the little sin, the little offense, other people forgive you. You are still talking about it. You will not forgive. You will not forget. And then Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 24, verse 25, verse 34, verse 35. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart, not from your lips, if ye from your heart, not just by writing an hypocritical letter, well, I forgive you, forget about it, if you from your heart forgive not, everyone is brother in their trespasses. The Lord wants you if you have enjoyed forgiveness. And if you want to keep on enjoying that forgiveness from the Lord, to also forgive the offenses of others against you. Remember, sin is the most terrible thing that could ever be present in anyone's life. Because it has eternal consequences. I don't want you to just say, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, I'm so and so. Look at your life today. Do you need initial forgiveness? To be able to enter into the kingdom? Or do you need parental forgiveness to be able to remain in the kingdom? And aren't you going to tell the Lord and pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Let it come to my heart right now. And from now on, O oh Lord, help me by your grace that I, even I in this flesh, thy will will be done on earth here while I'm still alive as it is done in heaven. And Lord, I'm not asking for too many material things. Just give me, give us this day, only our daily bread. And Lord, if sin is there, where am I going to spend eternity? Forgive us. Let's rise up and pray. Are you born again? Born again? Born again? I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. Talking about victory over sin. Or are you missing the mark every day and not thinking about it? Are you transgressing, stepping across the line of God's authoritative word every day and not thinking about it? Are you lawless, behaving anyhow, talking anyhow, acting anyhow? God is watching you. If you will repent, the Lord will forgive. Let the Spirit of the Lord search your heart. And make sure that you are ready for heaven. If you miss heaven, it will be terrible. If you miss heaven, it will be terrible.
Preaching will not cover up your sin. Walking miracle healing the sick will not cover up your sin. Paying tithes and giving money will not cover up your sin. Speaking in tongues does not cover up sin. Are you pure within and without? In secret and in the public. Pure in thought. Pure in your words. Pure in your motive. If you miss heaven, what will you do? If you miss heaven, what will you do? All the chance to repent would have gone. All the chance to come back and say, I'm sorry, would have gone. All the chance for restitution would have gone. Be sincere before the Lord. Don't let your position in the church keep you in sin. Don't deceive yourself. The soul that sinneth shall die. And the sin of the preacher is more serious. Don't sin against the light. What shall it profit a man? Against a high position, against a lot of things, and he loses his own soul. What will you give in exchange for your soul? Should a trumpet sound now? Are you sure you are ready for heaven? Is that your goal? Is that your aim? Is that your goal?